Well, thank you all. I'm pleased to be here. I came back uh, from Missouri last night just to be here with you this morning. I thought it was important you see what a Republican looked like. Um, and after I, uh, after I listened to the president's speech in the other room on the, uh, on the closed circuit TV, I thought, well, I'm glad even if Harold and I didn't always agree, I've always told him exactly what I intended to do, and then I've always done it. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased to be here with you today. I heard the president, your president, uh, talk about the SAFER grants and the AFG grants, and uh, I'm going to be working with you to try to get those done. Uh, Kevin O'Connor is a good friend of our office and a good friend of Republicans and Democrats who are working toward any common goal when that common goal is out there. You know, the country uh, has been as divided uh, as it's ever been politically, narrowly divided as it's been politically for about 20 years now. And I will tell you what, one side is just not going to get anything done. Uh, it always has gone, particularly when you have divided government, by definition, one side's not going to get anything done. But I was the whip in the House for a long time. Uh, the, the majority whip, though, whatever that show is about the majority whip, I'm, I will tell you it's not like that. I told my wife it wasn't like that, too, by the way. Um, I was the majority whip for a long time. We had a, one year we had a turnaround margin of four. We never passed anything without... Democrats and Republicans both, both voting for it. In fact, in the six years I was the majority whip, we passed two bills in six years that didn't have, and I was the Republican whip, we passed two bills in six years that didn't have some Democrats, and normally a significant number of Democrats vote for them, because that's the way we had to write them. And why do we have to write them that way? Because we wouldn't have gotten them done if we hadn't written them that way. You know, I think too many people in our politics today on both sides, run for office, thinking about the primary, and when they're doing that, they say, I'll never do anything, I'll never vote for anything that's not exactly the way I want it to be. When I've been in the Congress for a while and I have never voted for a perfect bill, I've introduced a couple of perfect bills, <laughs> but I've never voted for a perfect bill. I've never voted for a bill that I didn't think could be improved in some way, but I've all voted for many bills that I thought this is the most we can get done right now. And the country expects the government to work, even though it has snowed a couple of inches, so the federal government shut down today. My, I didn't even wear my tie today, not because I didn't think most of you'd have your tie on, but I thought, well, I'm gonna have to get out and push my car or something to get over there. And of course, the streets are pretty navigable today, but the federal government's shut down. Uh, but uh, the result would be about the same as if the federal government was working. <laughs> be hard to tell. We need to get back to a government that works, and just like you work. And you know, one of the reasons that Kevin and I and others uh, are talking about how what we can do to be sure we have the right equipment, to be sure we have the right training for our firefighters, is you're the people who are going to get there first. I talked to uh, the Missouri firefighters just within the last couple of days, and I said, let me be sure, we were having coffee, and I said, let me be sure I have this absolutely straight in my mind. If there's, if there's another, if there's an incident where there, there's a, a, a law enforcement problem, a terror problem, something has to happen, my sense is that the law enforcement guys are out securing the perimeter while you're securing, you're, you're trying to save people at the location. The first people on the scene, the last people to leave the building are the people who are the first responders and are firefighters, uh, and the country learned to appreciate that after 9-11 like the country hadn't appreciated that before. But you know, every time we move a few steps away from uh, a scary moment like that, we begin to forget just how scary that moment was. We begin, we begin to forget just how vulnerable we are. We begin to forget who the first people were who went into the building. We begin to forget who the last people were that came out of the building, and because of that, some of them didn't come out. But you need, you're ready to do that. Uh, and the equipment that uh, you got in equipment grants uh, 15 years ago, air tanks don't need have to be replaced. The equipment's not what it was, may have been used to the point that it was uh, almost worn out anyway, may not have been used very often, but you can't use it because for whatever reason, those things get dated. And we have to be sure we continue to remember 
the front lines of our first responders. That includes law enforcement as well as firefighters. Sec Senator Coons and I, uh, as uh, the president said, we, we founded, uh, Senator Coons, a Democrat from Delaware, and I founded uh, the Law Enforcement Caucus when we, when we went to the Senate uh, three and a half years ago. And we continue to try to be out there, whether it's the Victims of Child Abuse Act or other law enforcement and grant funds that really support law enforcement and our first responders, uh, we want to be out there doing that. But let me just say that the government, you deserve a government that works. I heard the President mention uh, Barbara Mikulski, the Democrat chairman, as all the chairmen in the Senate are these days, and I'm, I don't agree, by the way, with the view we need to work hard to maintain that, but I understand the President's <laughs> long-held view that that would be the right thing to do. It's just one of those places where we significantly disagree. We do agree, however, that Barbara Mikulski is going to be a great chairman of the Appropriations Committee because she wants to get the work done. She wants to get the work done, and I do too, and Senator Shelby, the leading Republican on that committee, does as well. And frankly, nothing would be better for the federal government than just to do the basic work of the Congress. The basic work of the Congress, President, is to debate our priorities. You know, we, we don't execute the laws. Uh, we make the laws. And if we don't go through the right process of making the laws, the right things don't happen. You know, in, in legislating as in, in life, there is a right order of things. And occasionally you can violate the right order of things and it will all work out fine in spite of everything you did. But if you do it over and over and over again, eventually you begin to figure out why that was the way people said your life should work or why that was the way the Congress should work. Now, for seven years now, the Senate hasn't brought the appropriations bills to the floor the way you're supposed to. I, I'm, I'm not going to cast any particular blame here, but it needs that work needs to be done. Last year, when we had the line-by-line -line cutting, which didn't have to happen, it only happened because there was a law that said everybody agreed to that said how much money we'd spent, and the old appropriation, the one we just continued spending the way we'd been spending, spent more money than that. So you had to do this silly, needless, line-by-line -line cutting. So as we brought, I was on the Defense Committee as well as the Defense Author Appropriating Committee, and when we brought the service chiefs in, every one of them said, well, this sequestration is terrible. Now, if you pressed a little bit, they'd say, it's, it's terrible if it goes on for very long. Nobody was, could argue with a straight face there wasn't money to find everywhere that could be spent better. But they said it's terrible, but then every one of them said, you're, you're, not only is it terrible, but you're cutting a budget that we haven't wanted for six years. You know, when you hear this language, it, what you all are familiar with, but some of the people you work for, as you represent, may not be the, the continuing resolution. What does that mean? That means we can't decide how to spend the money this, this year, so we're just going to spend it the way we spent it last year. And, you know, one time, that's probably not a terrible thing. Two times, it may not be a totally destructive thing. Seven times, it's a really bad thing. And so they came in and said, look, you're, you're cutting lines in a budget that's not even reflective of what we need to do to defend the country. And every one of them, since Admiral McRaven from Special Ops said it was the CR was worse than the sequestration. Others said it was either worse, equally as bad, or almost as bad. Nobody said it didn't matter. What they were saying was, Get back and look at our priorities. Just be like if at home you set aside money one year to remodel the bathroom and then for the next seven years you couldn't spend that amount of your income for anything but remodeling the bathroom. Now in government that means you have really two choices. One is to not do anything to use the remodeling the bathroom money for. Or in government as likely as not at the federal level we're as likely as not to remodel the bathroom six times because that's the only thing you could spend that money for. Well, that year we were able to get those five of the appropriations bills up of the 12 updated to the normal priorities. And this year, what Senator Mikulski would like to do and I would like to do, and I think the country would benefit from, just bring those bills to the floor one at a time, all 12 of them. And the appropriators can go out there as they bring that bill to the floor. They've debated, they've prioritized. Let every member of the Senate come to the floor and say, here's, here's a better way to spend a million dollars. We'd take it from here and put it there. And almost every time, you, you're able to defeat that amendment because you've already had that debate. 
But if you don't have that debate for seven years, you forget why it was you were for what, what you're for. You forget why it was you were for the safer grants. You forget why it was for your better training and better equipment and why that was more important than something else. So we need to get back to business. And you need to do it the right way. And I heard the President's comments about the Affordable Care Act and I, I wasn't for it. I wasn't opposed to all of it. In fact, I wrote a little piece of it. There's a piece in there that says that uh, if you, uh, you can stay on your parents' insurance a little bit longer, up to your 26. I, was the, I, I introduced that bill in the House when I was a House member. Senator Reid said the other day that 25% of all the people that have been added to, the, to insurance that didn't have it before were added through that part of the bill. 25%, one out of four. That part of the 2,600 page bill was three and a third pages. And it could have happened without the rest of the bill. And then you could have done something else that could have happened without the rest of the bill. When you try to when you try to do something this big and this quick that impacts everybody's health care and 17%, 16 or 17 percent of the economy, the law of unintended consequences is the law that's most likely going to apply. Taxes on, on policies that have been hard work uh, negotiated for over a long period of time, where you've negotiated, people have negotiated either individually or as you do collectively for benefits. That was, you gave up something to get that. And you know, this is a system that in many ways uh, developed accidentally. After World War II, wage and price controls were put in. The wage and price control person, that would have been a guy at that time, so let's just say the wage and price control guy decided, well, you could add insurance at work and that wouldn't count toward the wage cap. Now, why'd you have wage and price controls? World War II's over, people are competing for this returning workforce. There are lots of things that people have given up for four and five years that they'd like to have, new cars and other things. So how are you gonna, you're gonna keep the prices low, you, wage and price controls. So the wage and price control person decides, well, if you had insurance at work, that wouldn't count toward the wage cap. Now, up until that moment, most Americans didn't have in health insurance at work but it didn't cost very much. It was a competitive advantage. People began to add it. The IRS person decided, well, if it uh, doesn't count toward the wage cap, we won't tax it. It's 1952 before this becomes part of the law, but those two decisions made by, by people who thought they were doing the right thing led to a system where almost, where, where many, 85% of everybody that had health insurance had it at work, and it wasn't taxed, and because it wasn't taxed, it was an item to negotiate for and to get that off the table as much as you could. And then you come back in and decide, well, we're going to now tax this at a certain level. Of course, if that happens, how do you get back what you gave up to get that policy to start with? There's, there's nothing in the law that says that. Uh, it's another one of the, un it's like the part-time work. You know, the law says that unless people work 30 hours, you don't have to provide insurance. And interestingly, a whole lot of people no longer are working 30 hours. I saw a person the other day at a big retailer. I happened to be walking through the store. I knew the manager. I said, how you doing finding work employees these days? I didn't even ask my normal question, what are you doing about your health care? How you doing finding employees these days? I said, well, it's harder because we have to find 25% more than we used to find. And I thought for a minute, I said, oh, I get it. Everybody's working. The new employees working on the floor are all working less than 30 hours. So where you used to have to fire, hire three people, you now have to hire four people. But the message there is none of those people have a full-time job with benefits. Nobody, I didn't vote for this law, but nobody who voted for this law thought they were creating that unintended consequence, but they clearly did. And if, if you don't believe that, all you gotta do is look, turn one page over on any of the workforce numbers and the part-time workforce is much higher than it ever was before. The, um, we need to be concerned about take-home pay. We need to be concerned about a wage that families can live on. We need to be concerned about benefits they've, they've worked for. But we also need to be concerned about how they, they and their children are part of a growing American economy. I, I'm not looking at my watch here, but my body clock tells me that I might be about out of time, and I don't want to take advantage advantage of your time. I know I saw Governor 
Uh, the governor of Virginia out there a second ago, and he's waiting. I know you're looking forward to hearing him as well. Uh, but there are great things that can and should happen in our economy. American energy, what an incredible opportunity that is. You know, more American energy means more American jobs. If there is an easier economic formula than that, I don't know what it is. More American energy means more American jobs, and not just the jobs to create the energy, sure, the jobs to create the energy, but also the jobs that happen when, when you have a reliable utility bill and a delivery system you can count on. When that happens, Americans are going to make more things again than we have in a long time. It's not been that many years ago where we thought we were running out of natural gas. You go to an ag con, my mom and dad were dairy farmers. I'm the first person in my family to ever graduate from college. And you go to a, you'd go to an agriculture meeting of some kind 20 years ago, they'd say, man, these fertilizer prices, we're not going to be able to afford them at all because we're running out of natural gas. And it turns out we now believe we have more recoverable natural gas than anybody in the world. We have more coal than anybody in the world. We may have as much oil as anybody in the world because we figured out how to get to oil and gas that we didn't think we could get to just a few years ago. But the energy independence that gives us in North America, trading with our better trading partners, trading with people who like us, you know, there's nothing wrong with buying things from people who don't like you. I'm a member of one of the least popular groups in the, in the history of, of the world at this moment, the United States Congress. So I'm sure I buy things from people who don't like me. There's nothing wrong with buying things from people who don't like you, but it's crazy to have to buy things from people who don't like you. And it's almost as crazy to buy things from another economy if you could produce them competitively in your own economy, and we can do that. More American energy, all of the potential of the breakthrough moments from everything from smartphones, which can do, monitor a lot of health care concerns people have, uh, smartphones to 3D printing to, I think we're, the world agricultural needs, back to my, my farm boy background, world food needs are going to double between now and 2070, double, which means in the next 70 years, 60 or 70 years, we have to do what we've done in the previous 10,000 in terms of producing food for ourselves and the world. That's a great, it's a great challenge, but it's a great opportunity for our economy. For those of us who live in the middle of the country, every state, by the way, think is, a, is an agriculture state in, in most ways. But those of us who live in the vast middle of the country, the potential to see that drive our economy, private sector jobs, the government's doing what government should do. The president was kind to mention my support for the Marketplace Fairness Act. Uh, this means if you buy something on the internet that your state says is supposed to have a sales tax, you have to pay it. You know, our state says that, that if you buy on the internet, there's no internet tax. I'm not for taxing the use of the internet. I'm just for collecting the tax that the state governments say should be collected. In our state, you're supposed to fill it in on your annual income tax return. And last year, of the 6 million Americans, 300 of them filled that blank in. To 6 million Missourians. 300 of them. I, I don't know where all those UPS trucks are going and the FedEx trucks are going, but they must not be delivering what I thought they were delivering because only 300 people in my state filled out the line that said they got anything over the mail. Now, if you're not going to collect the tax, take it off the books. Repressive governments have laws on the books that they know everybody violates. Free governments have laws on the books that they know everybody can comply with. What you don't want to do is live in a country that has a bunch of laws on the books so that every single person in the country knows, hey, I've done something wrong, I just don't know what it was. You know, people like me have some obligation to get those laws off the books so that everybody sitting here and everybody sitting at your house knows that I am a free citizen of a free country and they can't come and get me because of some obscure law that nobody even knows is there. So if we're not going to collect that, take it off the books. But in fairness to people who you go in their store and try on the wedding dress, or you go in their store and look at the, t the TV and write down the numbers and go home, and the only difference may be, you know, the average sales tax in the country is between six and seven percent, between seven and eight percent. That's a pretty good difference, though, on a big item. If that's the only difference, you know, you, you use the police protection, 
the fire protection, the sidewalk, the parking space to go in and try on that item or to go in and look at that item, but now you want to go home and not pay for any of that protection that you took advantage of or those, uh, the infrastructure you took advantage of because you're not going to pay the tax that 30, almost 40 states say you have to pay. Let's have laws that people understand. Let's have laws that we can enforce. Let ha let's not have laws we don't need. Uh, and I suppose most important for my purpose here today, uh, let's remember the sacrifice, the risk, the dedication of people who work for us. Thank you all for letting me be here.